this got everybody upset. <laughs> and uh, I got everybody upset and threats and shooting at me. And Oh, really? Many times with motorcycle driving to my office and trying, you know. This was in New Jersey? In New York. In New York. And John Gotti. And I, I told him, come kill me, get it over with. You told John Gotti to come? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I gave him an address. I said, leave to one West Department, West 21st Street Department 12G. You want to kill me, get it over with. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Gents Talk podcast. We're coming to you live from Miami at the Kimpton Epic Hotel in beautiful, sunny Florida. Although it hasn't really been sunny the last few days, but uh, you know what, we'll, we'll put up with it. Our special guest today is billionaire, philanthropist, real estate developer, entrepreneur, mogul, you name it, Moishe Mana, who has done a ton of incredible things across Miami, across New York, has an incredible story. And I'm really excited to, to sort of share this conversation with you, Moshe, because I think there's going to be so much that you and I can cover and talk about from your upbringing, how you came to America, how you started from nothing, and where we can really learn from someone like yourself who's basically done it all and you're still going, you're still doing more and more each day. But let's hear it in your own words. Who is Moshe Mana? Okay, Moshe still keep, you know, keep getting evolved. It's always evolving. And that's, and that's really where I'm blessed. You know, I did not stay who I am and I kept evolving. But in general, uh, I came, it's a, it's a real uh, immigrant story. We come here and start with nothing. And, uh, and I did, there was no Google, there was no maps, there was nothing. Just landed in New York. I want to change my life. And, and uh, I didn't uh, connect uh, to the place I was born, and um, I wanted to have a different life. So I came to New York, and from a dishwasher, part washer, I had a moving uh, company I built, and from there I diversified, and I kept building businesses, and and uh, and doing great things for the community and for. Uh, for my friends, for my family. Um, but over the years, I, you know, as I told you, I, I evolved because I was in so many businesses and, and I built businesses. Unlike most people, when they have one business and they succeed with it, I had many, many, many different businesses, different areas, because I like to challenge myself in different areas. And, and I built business from the ground up and uh, but uh, it's you know real estate and technology and fashion and art and and entertainment and logistics and and agriculture. But uh, in the last twelve years, fourteen years, I evolved because I I just didn't want, I didn't see myself keep doing just another business or, or another you know I just wanted to do something that uh, much more impactful and, and 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 something that can really. Uh, can change people's life. I call it social impact investment. And uh, and I decided that all my knowledge that I have, I can really do something different. It's really building, it's building communities, digital and physical, because um, in the last uh, uh, 20 years, 25 years, I identified this need of people to go back to live to community living. And we went, it was Facebook, it was Amazon, but nobody did uh, physical and physical and digital. And at the time, uh, WeWork was on the rise and I had my disagreement with them totally about what they're doing and how they're doing it. And in many instances, I told them, they're all gonna go to jail and, 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 it's, and, and it's not, community and it's not technology and I was trying even to convince them to convince Adam to come and build physical and digital but uh, they didn't want to listen and so I said we're gonna do I'm gonna do myself and I bought in Jersey City uh, 17 acres I assembled it 
abandoned warehouses. I created the biggest art center. See, I came from the meatpacking. I was the first one pioneer in the meatpacking. And it gave me a good overview of how neighborhood can evolve and how community can evolve. The good and the bad. And I realized that within cities, it's very difficult to build communities because every time there is a bad area, turn it to a good area. In the process, there is great energy at the beginning. But later on come the hedge fund the developer and cannibalize the neighborhood and everybody disappears yeah. and nothing left after a while. So I figured that we could do something that's more sustainable, where I can get the, the community more growing and, and, and developing by, by capitalizing on the, I call it the GDP of the neighborhood, the economy of the neighborhood, rather than just on the rent. Because the neighborhood, they are consumers, so connect them with an application, and they are, and they are uh, producers, so might as well invest with them, restaurant, bars, technology, fashion, whatever services they have, you know. This was the original philosophy, and we put this art center in Jersey City, because for a while I didn't work, for nine years I kind of disappeared, and, and I needed to reconcile it myself, and um, travel the world, and some good, some bad, time lost. Thank Why did you need the time away? No, because you see, when you really, you do, you do, you do, you take a stop, and then you start really, when you don't have, a goal, then you start really going aside, maybe sometime, and many times you go backward. And that's exactly what happened. But I will, you know, I took myself and, and I really took myself for conversation when I came back and, and I said, we got to stop it. And I came back and I got into Jersey City and, and I did what I did and, to, and I came to Miami. And Miami represented a whole new opportunity and uh, a whole new vision that uh, got evolved over the years. And I figured that, but it just wasn't in one day. It's like an onion that you keep peeling it yeah. and so forth. So today the art center is, 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 is doing great service for all these artists that we have. The artists work, create, sell, we have fashion, uh, changing Jersey City, I would say. And then uh, in Miami, I went to Wynwood, and it was a very bad area called Wynwood. And I. And why did you pick that area specifically? Because it was a feeling, because where it's located, and uh, just the location. And I was really tired of South Beach because I used to go sometime to South Beach, and South Beach became very jaded, jaded very inclusive harassment, this was really not much. And I started staying more and more in Miami. I really felt like Miami need a new cultural hub. And I assembled 45 acres, very cheap. Very, very, very cheap. $18 a foot, $20 a foot. Now we're selling 1,000 a foot. So that's cheap. So good investment. It was very good investment. So I started really doing, and I told people, watch me. You know, I was criticized and I was doubted. And Why were they criticizing you? Because of the area? Of course. You know, when you come there and you see uh, people injecting needles and needles everywhere, and you see prostitutions and you see, uh, you hear shooting and, and the police pick you up five o'clock. If, uh, you know, if you're not from the neighborhood, put you in the car and get you to get out of the neighborhood. So, uh, so you know, some, different people have different business models, but my business model is really going into this bad area, going and buying real estate, bad real estate where people don't want, and changing the use. And I started doing music event, fashion event, art event, and every year I was spending two million, three million, money that I don't have the cash, I must say, you know, when I came back, uh, you know, I mean, uh, cash was very tight and I needed to do all kind of exercises to, to get some cash to put the vision together. And and I, if, when I needed to sell one, I sold, and it was really bad economy also, lost a lot of cash in, this, in the stock market. So I assembled it, and I said, here we're gonna become the cultural hub, hub for Miami. And all this event that I was doing really paid off, and you can see today what's happening. But as I was really setting my foot in Miami, I, I totally understood how weak the economy is, and people asking me for jobs, and, it was very hard for me to understand. I mean, these people, they, they did what they were asked. They went to school and, you know, 
Uh, they want to give uh, and they're not lazy, they, they, you know. And I totally understood that we need to do something about the economy. And then I discovered the whole issue of Miami geographically where it's located. Why is it an issue? Because Miami, this is what I realized, should capitalize on its geographic location. Well, it's a great location. It's sitting between Latin America and North America. Latin America is 700 million people and North America 400 million people. So real quick, I figured out that this should be the Western Hemisphere Global Hub. And there's no reason that the economies of America would not be one. I traveled the Far East, I worked with China, Vietnam and all these places. What's the reason to go produce over there and not here? Especially when, as I was traveling Latin America, I understood that how the potential that is really, there's a lot of stigma, a lot of problems, a lot, whatever you call it. And, but it's sitting right next to us. And uh, 700 million people, yes, it's standalone economies, rich countries, but poor people because they have a lot of resources. But together, when you put them together, 700 million people. This is a strong economy. And as Trump was rising, so I came up with the idea of creating a global hub, physical and digital, to, con um, to represent products from the Far East, Latin America, North America, B2B, that uh, a marketplace. And I was able to get two, 10 million square feet on the west side of Greenwood, 10 million, uh, because I want to do a robust global you hub. You wanted to build something out, essentially. Yeah, and I got the permits when we were doing with China, it was dealing with Latin America and signing agreement until came uh, Trump. And I figured, you know, when I'm working and I'm doing something for the future, something to impact people. So you feel a responsibility to, to use your voice, your platform, your reach, your network. To... Absolutely. That's why I'm working for, yeah. to create a better future for others too. So you're very much, your, your whole sort of ethos for everything that you're doing is very much for, for building out communities. Of course. To empower and grow the communities for other people. Of course. To yeah. leave behind something. You know, yeah. it's, I always say, you know, I mean, it's what I'm doing here. It's, it's a legacy project that, you know, that I leave something behind. I came here to this world. I ate the food of the world. I, I drank the water of the world. What am I going to leave behind? Mm -hmm. So came to America with nothing. America rewarded me, so I need to give back. Have you always had this sort of grand vision? Like when you first came to America and you started working, did you always envision yourself sort of building on such a large scale? I do not know the scale, but from a young age, you know, I was raised, I said, I'm going to save my family and the future and, and I'm not going to accept because I grew up in a poor neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So from a young age, I had a sense of responsibility to break every a glass ceiling, if you know, I went to the best school in Tel Aviv, although I have the obstacle and the, and the differences. And when I finished there, I, I did what I did. I came to America because always I felt like I need to break another glass ceiling and not stay the same. You yeah. know, I mean, I was very kind of, always I had expectation for myself. Let's put it this way. I was expect, I was, I had expectation for myself mm -hmm. to decide what, how, of course it come, it became, more mature, more depth, more width to it, you know, so it wasn't just, and, and, and this is what part of my success because most people measure success with money. Um, you don't measure it by money? It's one measurement, one, one element. What are the other measurements? What, you as a person, how you evolved? Are you a better person? Hmm. What you give back, what you leave behind, uh, how you impact other people's life. You look at Bill Gates. He worked hard all of his life. What he's doing? He wakes up every morning to give his money back to other people, you know. I mean, that's what people should be doing, I mean, at one point, but not everybody's doing it. But uh, at certain age, a certain time in your life, I believe priority must change, you know, and you have to look where you put your money, where you put your investment, you put your energy, and, and if you really can really do stuff that you can change, other people's life and not just being a cannibal because you're not taking with you the money. I mean, 
It's not coming with you. You're not coming with you, and you're not taking even Bitcoin. I say, yeah. you know. <laughs> so I better leave some good memories behind, and yeah. and and, uh, and uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, some people live in this life, and like they're gonna uh, they're gonna live forever. Hmm. And I just look at them; they're older, and, and what you're gonna live, you're gonna live forever. But you're gonna live like we never lived here. Yeah. You know, you leave money. Who who was remembered for the money that he had? Yeah. You know, they for built the this, they did they, this, they impact yeah. this, then you know, I mean that's the way people measured many times. So So how does how do you want people to remember Moishe? The name. By what I do, by what I achieve, you know, I mean and uh, if you know, by how what I achieve and and what I'm doing today is I don't know if I'm going to do more. There's different areas that I'm working on, but what I'm doing today is really connecting the Americas and making Miami Western Hemisphere hub. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I got to Latin America as Trump was, you know, but it started really earlier running around the technology companies. And I figured that all these technology companies have slim to none chances to raise money. How come? Who's going to go to Colombia to invest in technology companies? I see. It's 50 million people economy. Right. Or who's going to go to Panama if I'm in there? But I figured if I bring them to Miami to operate from one place, certain functions of the company, mm-hmm. then it's 700 million people economy. So when you do an app, you can do the Uber, you can do the WhatsApp. 700 million. So you're going to find people to invest, but people are not going to fly. Yeah. So this is the beginning of the change. I call it building the infrastructure. You're building a bridge between the digital the infrastructure of Latin America should be built for Miami. That's what I said because I saw them also in Latin America. Some of these t- technology companies and nobody take them seriously with them because it's small economy. They never looked at it as a whole 700 million people. They looked at it as Mexico. They looked at it as Colombia, but right. not, not as, as a whole. big hole. Yeah. So I came to. Do they look at themselves as a big hole? Is there is there collaboration between countries? Now there is much more. Okay. Of course, thanks to what we are doing. So, uh, so when so I came, so I started really buying in downtown Flagler, the live work play community idea combining with Latin America technology, mm-hmm. and I started buying and I was able to put together about eighty properties, eight zero. It's a lot of properties. <laughs> buying most of downtown because it was. Abandoned, destroyed. Mm-hmm. Every owner was 80 years old, 90 years old, 25 kids own a building. So nobody had the incentive to do any changes. Mm-hmm. So I figured if I buy enough, I can really, it's going to be, I can impact it, can be sustainable. And, and uh, went to the city and I was able, city and the county and mayors, and I created a whole vision for the street, carbon stone, walkable. Uh, I paid the money to do that, and I was able to raise forty million dollars to do it, and now it's under construction. And at the same time, I ended up myself. City, uh, I hired uh, architect, couple of architects to sit down and design, and to reflect the vision that I wanted for Winwood and downtown, because I couldn't get the right art- art- architect to reflect the vision, because everybody thinking in terms of square foot and and, 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 and maximum mm-hmm. and thank God I think we created an amazing amazing vision uh, uh, everybody will see the, the the love it and downtown not every building has to be this like this I mean it has to be combination keeping the old DNA of the city even if I don't take up the, everything off the table or I can build a story in every property but it's not the point you know so keeping bringing DNA and why is keeping the original DNA so important? I like to connect the old and the new. I think it's cool. Mm-hmm. And um, and history is important. I love history. I study history. I read history. I'm, and uh, this building is, you know, part of history. So some of them need to be kept. You know, although the city did not, I'm not, I'm not ob- 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 obligated by the city. It's not uh, um, a grandfather kind of situation. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, I chose to keep many of these buildings, bring them back to the old condition because it has a great architecture, a great architect, and I felt bad really demolishing them. But I have enough to build towers, you know, so not everything I need to take off the table. Is it 
do you look at building buildings and taking on new projects is, is do you look at it almost like a game now where it's a, just a, another Absol- challenge absolutely not a game this is not a game that's not a game this is something that really i think can impact the city can impact the the us can impact the uh, latin america many people um, it you know this is the facilities that are going to house all our ideas hmm. um, uh, you know, I mean, uh, to, uh, you know, in order to execute everything I'm saying, you need building and 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 you need to initiate it. Uh, you know, this is the thing, you know. Now today, in Latin America, and I and we have constantly now so many delegations and so many companies coming to our facility for uh, education, raising money, relationships, and it's become a movement. Mm-hmm. You know, we the Manatec that I founded. What eight years ago, organization that I'm funding it for my own money till today. It's like a nonprofit. It's not. It's not only nonprofit. Losing money. <laughs> okay, and uh, this is I'm funding it to to execute the vision that I set forward, and now today it's a real uh, organization with dozens and dozens of companies and, and delegations of countries and. Mm. Uh, coming in here and, and 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 to collaborate and to connect and the whole idea, and the, and and what really was most important really, that I I identified this young uh, uh, power coming from every country that we go, and and they want to make changes in their own countries, mm-hmm. and the idea is to connect them because today they have this, and it's and it's much easier. You can do a lot on that. Yeah. So today they can reach out and. And, and and connecting this, harnessing these positive forces, I think there are people who really are doing their worst and and separating. We belong to the people I like to say to people who connect and do the positive. Mm-hmm. I always say let them do their worst and let them do our best and see how we're going to end up. Yeah. And now we have all these people coming in. The same thing, Miami as a city is lacking a lot of culture. A lot. It's very diversified, but there's not enough culture, really. I mean, there's not enough York. culture in Miami. How come? Uh, Ten years was much harder, even. There was nothing. There's no facility to. I see. You know, there's none. Yeah, it doesn't exist. You know, I mean, when you go to New York, you see. When you go to Milan, you see. So, another element, bringing fashion. We don't have fashion here, and all we got 20, 30 million tourists coming in and out. Where do they go shopping? You right. know? There's no spirit of fashion and, and show on showroom and design. It's not in the air. So we created this organization called Mana Fashion to a service and help all these fashion companies and designers come to Miami, operate from Miami, sell in Miami. We got 10,000 members already and the uh, material bank and uh, showroom, stuff that I do it very cheap for now. I will make money sooner or later. Okay, so uh, <laughs> it's an but, investment, long term. But it's a long term investment, and it's part of what I do. And just like I did this event space in Winwood, and cost me two, three million dollars. It's no different than what I'm doing today. Hmm. Can I ask? Uh, all of these ventures, all of these businesses. What's been the one consistent thing you do to achieve success in all your projects? Is there something that stands out that you, anytime you take on a new project, you know, this is how I have to approach it? Well, first of all, when I take a project, I don't look at it in like in terms of tomorrow. Nothing I look at it. I look how exponential it is and where it can go, mm-hmm. the potential of it. But historically, looking back, and thanks God, what really I stick to, my main business was uh, logistic. And, uh, and storage business. Mm-hmm. This let me buy a lot of real estate all over the US, cheap through recessions, and fill them with documents and uh, storage. And, and retrospective, because I didn't sell, I didn't speculate, I kept building the business and putting money back in. This was the fact that I carried forward with one, you know, and then from there I found all this outlet. And today I'm ready to exit to uh, the logistics because I have enough with what we're doing in here. But uh, we're still in logistics and we have 
third largest document management in America, digital, physical, in Latin America. We also we sold in China, but uh, uh, but being you know like people who jump from business to business to business without having one business that can really carry them through. Because you go into business, you don't know how it's going to end mm -hmm. up. You know, many reasons you can f fail. You know, especially when you're doing a lot of stuff. Yeah. So jumping sides without having backbone, it's a problem. And how do you how do you scale your businesses? How does if someone is listening to this and says, you know, I'm in the process of building out my business and I'm looking to to grow it, you know, to the scale of you know what you've essentially done, or you know they're trying to achieve something like that. What do you do, or what do you look for to identify if a business can be scaled? Well, it's really is it like people. This, so is it funding? Is no, it no, no, no. The, okay, not okay. Money always is, is not the problem. People most time are the problems, okay? <laughs> so, uh, you know, managing people, it's very difficult, very hard. There's always surprises along the way. But philosophically, if your business is correct, even when you go the other direction, you're going to end up going on the highway. Right. And, and, and fix. I made a lot of mistakes in the past, but you know, because I did not go to business administration and yeah. and I was really you started, learned as you I started doing. as a dishwasher, you know, yeah. and how do you build a business and you go from a little shop, all of a sudden you have a supermarket without realizing you have a supermarket. So you have to fix aisle and you have to put departments and you have to do this. Uh, you know, many people went through it. Some people went through it and, and, and fell. Yeah. Did not, were not able to get to the next level. Yeah. But uh, I had, uh, you know, constantly, I had the enough time to go and fix and correct the mistakes and, and organize. So it was a total commitment, total commitment. You said people are the, the problem most of the time. How do you find good people? What do you look for? Good people you don't find, you make them good. Okay. Okay. Can you explain that a little more? Because you can get great people and you put them in the wrong uh, environment or you mismanage them, they're going to turn bad. Yeah. You know, so you really have to be able, like, imagine you are like a coach. You can get a great player and put him to play the wrong position, the wrong place. You're going to destroy him. Yeah. So you as a manager, as, as a coach, your job is to get the best out, out of every person that you hire and how to put them and how to organize them. Yeah. It's no different in business. You have to think like you're a coach. You have to motivate them, you have to drive them, you incentivize them. Um, and, um, you know, so it's really, it's what you make out of people. Okay. How do you incentivize them? I mean, money is an obvious one, but is there some other form of incentive that... Of course, first of all, you treat them with respect. That's a big one. I you think know, that's that's a thing for basically anything. People who work for you, they're not your slaves. You're, they're your equally, just like they, yeah. and then even more, you know. So with every job that people do, you treat them with respect and and you cannot disrespect them. And I always tell my people, you know, they spend more time at the office than they spend time at home. So we better make it nice for them because we never pay enough for this. <laughs> You know, people who work for you, they give you the, they give you their life. Really. The yeah. best time, prime time of their life, they come and work for you. This so is big. you feel like a responsibility to, to build. Huge that. responsibility. Yeah. Huge responsibility. That's why I have so many people for me, with me 30 years, 35 years. And uh, the salary is double and three times and four times and what the market I can get. And I always say, you know, it's not, I'm not paying for what they do today. I'm paying what they did in the past. And not only this, I, I, I created many millions around me and many people worked for me, we became millionaires and we became partners with different businesses and mm. uh, some of them chose to go by themselves. And, but always, you know, I try to, if they're good people, we should keep in touch with them, you know, should sure. work with them, you know. Do you, if you can go back in time and give young Moishe advice when you're starting off, when you were still a dishwasher, what advice would you give yourself? Knowing the everything ones. you know today. Huh? Knowing everything you know today. The truth, people have must have spinal cord. Hmm. You can't see exactly. 
You have to take risks. You must no no risk no reward. But what was the biggest? You know, risk like you like you know, it's like you have to think like you're a boxer. You know, you're gonna get punched, but you got to stand up. You know, I mean, when I started at the time, I was doing this that the reporter asked me, "What do you, you attribute your success?" So I said, "Some people succeed because of desperation. Some people are wrong of inspiration. I had desperation, inspiration. I had no way to go back, but yet I inspired what I saw. Hmm. So, uh, uh, you know, if anything, I can advise somebody. It's just keep doing, you know, if you do not know, ask, but you got to have integrity. And what was the biggest risk you took? You said that if there's no risk, there's no reward. Is there a, a risk that stands out to you? That, you know, when you took it on, you didn't know if this is going to work. Every day you take a risk. Everything you do, you take a risk. You know, everything is a risk. You hire the wrong person sitting next to you. It's a risk. You... You, you put investment here, it's a wrong risk. You do this move, you do this. But you see, like, it's, it's like driving through a tunnel. And you, you cannot drive and see the bricks that in the tunnel, and maybe I'm going to run into these bricks. You got to, you, you, you know, drive. And, yeah. and decision making, it's, this is risky. But you got to keep decision every minute of the day. So some of them big decisions, some of them small decisions. So I try to, the small decisions to give it to the people who work for me, this different level. Mm -hmm. But the big, big decisions, I like to keep for myself because it's not many of them. So I better think about what I'm doing. Yeah. You, when you left Tel Aviv and you came here to the US, that's a risk. That was a risk for you to take, to, to start, to come here. Not and start for a second, I thought it's a risk. Really? Why? Because for a lot of people leaving where they were, where they came from to go somewhere completely new and start from scratch is a huge risk. But you Not see it differently. For a second, even when I slept in the park, I didn't think it's a risk. Not for a second. I was so inspired and so driven and so up, like, up on life. For, for me, it was no option. You know, when you don't have an option, you, you can't go, you can't look back. You got to focus. Hmm. And nobody could stop me at the time. It Is was that, unstoppable. Do you still carry that same, do you still find yourself inspired today? Today, it's uh, less inspiration and more kind of uh, purpose. Okay. You know, and, and uh, uh, you know, it's just like, it's much more mature, like, it, you know, inspiration usually get, oh, I'm going to build this, I'm going to change my life, and I'm going to get this, and I'm going to get that, mm -hmm. and I'm going to get a car, and I'm going to get a big house, and I can help this, and I can do that, but it's not like that. Yeah. You know, so um, I had my uh, uh, obstacles in life and, and, and issues that I, that I saw, and maybe I will do it in a movie, and uh, when I started also, I had... Uh, a big issue with the, the the tracking business was all controlled by mafia and and union and uh, uh, I broke the union basically the the, the tracking industry over there. Really? Uh, yeah, of course. So I did non-union and this got everybody upset <laughs> and uh, I got everybody upset and threats and shooting at me and oh really? Many times with motorcycle driving to my office and trying you know. And, this was in New Jersey. In New York. New York. And John Gotti. And I, I told him, come kill me, get a book with. You told John Gotti to come? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I gave him an address. I said, leave to one West Apartment, West 21st Street Apartment with 12G. You want to kill me, get it over with. I swear to God. Like you weren't this. afraid. I do not know what really was going through my mind. But I tell you stories, you will not believe that <laughs> a person can do that, you know? <laughs> and because I told him, listen, you're charging a man to push a dolly for thirty-five, fifty-five dollars an hour, and I can get a software, a software man to write me software for thirty-five dollars. There's a big gap. So you kill me, you need to get many other behind me, you know. But uh, it was daily stuff, you know. I mean, uh, 
<laughs> when I will reveal the whole story, I mean, I tell you something. Of how you told John Gotti to come and kill you. <laughs> yes. Wow. That's incredible. Yes. I did many other stuff, you know, when I was saying some, some the hitman, hitman of the mafia was still the name. And I came knocked on his door. I said, I came to kill you, you know, in, in, in Aelia. Wow. You know, so, so when, I, you, when you look back on these stories. I was so brave. Or oh, stupid. <laughs> I mean, I was going to ask, and I didn't want to be disrespectful. Stupid, Is it bravery you know? or, or just? You know, but listen, I was determined. My option was I'm going to go back there to be selling on the street yeah. or, or dishwashing. Or, you know. So finally, you saw, you saw the light. You, can't, you got to keep going. Yeah. You know. So how did you, you know, like. From... You know, every day I go home, I think they're going to kill me. Still to this day? No, no. Oh, no, back then. I go to the tent. And you didn't ever stop and think maybe I should stop? No. Wasn't an option. Not for a second. That determination to, to just keep pushing through. At the time. What what was the reason like what burned that fire? Because that comes from desperation. Somewhere. And that desperation came from Where I grew up? Growing up poor. Growing up poor. Seeing how the world operates. And I don't have it. My family don't have it. My father don't have it. No. So you want to make the change. Incredible. The decision you make yeah. from a young age. And it stuck with you this whole time. All the time. Was there ever a time where you doubted yourself? Not for a second. Not for a minute. Even when you look back and you think about it. It's... Never, never did. Wow. What advice would you give other entrepreneurs, young people looking to, to start a business, looking to get into something like this. You know, they want, they have, they have a dream, they have purpose, they want to build something to leave behind. They don't know where to start. First of all, you got to start somewhere. Yeah. Okay. And, and if you don't know, don't sit at home and think what you want to do. While you're working, think what you want to do. Go get the job. Go get the dishwashing. Go get a messenger. Go drive a truck. Go do something yeah. while you want. You like you're thinking what you want to do. Many people can sit at home for the rest of their life thinking what they want to do. Yeah. So you got to be out to find what you want to do. Go work for a company. Yeah. Learn something. Like industry. Go work for a company. Learn what is the business all about. And then go open your own business. I mean, if you choose to. Uh, but uh, laziness, it's uh, and and and, and pros like hesitant. Yeah, procrastination. Like, how to say? Procrastination. Procrastination. I can't <laughs> spell it. Procrastination. You, this is the biggest enemy. You know. Yeah. I mean, procrastination is like that. You do for long enough, it's really made a decision not to decide. You know. Yeah. And uh, people who don't decide don't go anywhere. That's the worst. When you made your first million, and then when you made your first billion, did you feel any different? Okay. First of all, even though I didn't have a million, I thought I'm a millionaire. So your mindset was always that you are... When I saw what I'm building, even when I had three trucks or four trucks, I said, I am a millionaire. Yeah. I never thought that at that point, I, I you know. Yeah. But the... I don't sit at home and count my money and count valuation, what I have, what I don't have. Mm -hmm. I never did it. It's a distraction. Until today. Until today, like you started doing that or you I still today, today don't you don't do it? Don't you don't do it. Do it. Okay. So you just find it out. It doesn't from matter. You have one billion or two or three or five or 20 or 30. I really focus what I want to do and what I want to change and what I want to create, you know? Yeah. Do you find people get too caught up in I'm a millionaire, I'm a billionaire, I made this much, I made that much. Do you find people these days are getting too caught up in that as opposed to, like you said, finding the purpose? These are small souls. Small souls. Interesting. Why? Because they're stuck with the money. I mean, what is money? What is money? It's papers. Yeah. Uh, it's an idea. You have in the bank 10 billion. What do you do with it? Yeah. How do you impact others? I mean, what's the agenda? They have 20, so you have 20, you have 100. 
it's small souls the people who really think like this you know, they're people not able to grow themselves so it's very narrow you got to grow up yeah it's not minded narrow soul is there anything that you have like a project you haven't done yet that is on your radar something that you look at and you go you know one day I want to do something I want to do X well of course you know because I'm I mean we're doing and we need to complete everything with to do and this and that as we do we do but there's different area you know where because I uh, am big followers of Nikola Tesla mm-hmm. and uh, I had an attempt to create a free energy company okay and you had intent like you tried or you're I tried, I tried. and it didn't work it didn't work how come didn't work you know we tried different uh, approaches cost me a few million dollars and uh, uh, because he spoke about free energy we need to yep. find out what did he mean because everything he said he was right about you know so I assume there is a source of energy here where we can tap into but philosophically I'm not engineer and I'm not electrician and I'm not a scientist but uh, the fact that the earth the earth spinning around itself this is the biggest magnet mm-hmm. exists and spinning around the, the sun this should be able we should be able to learn how to use that energy to use the energy yeah. you know that of this movement of the earth but this is something uh, you know we work on a couple of in, it's investment uh, side but not for money hmm. but if I can really be part of something like this if there is something like this at all but one day I think we're going to find out is there anything like are you aware of anything else any of the projects like that that are being worked on right now we research many projects there's not one nothing that not stands one, out you know. but uh, I work with the Nikola Tesla well, you built a, there was a building that you developed that was called the, the Nikola the Tesla, Tesla Innovation Hub. Hub. Yeah. yeah. And what is there a purpose behind that particular building? You see, if there's anything that we should really do, we should really bring uh, Nikola Tesla to the, first, uh, to the front stage. Because this guy not only changed our life, he could have cha- he could have done done even better, you know, because he was not just a scientist or inventor. He was a philosopher. He was a doctor, and he was a people understood. He was a person understood. Who somehow he tapped into secret of universe. He came from the future. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> and and so I think uh, you know we should bring his philosophy to the for, to the to the forefront and and uh, memorize him for uh, who he is and give him the respect that he deserved but also capitalize on what he meant to say or he was about to say on uh, he was taken away from him it's a man who was robbed uh, out of his uh, all of his work you know during his lifetime but I'm sure he's there and he's sitting up there and he's laughing and maybe he's crying <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, you know and, and and looking at us yeah any is there anything that you look back on your career and regret of course there's some regrets and i'm not going to share it here okay that's fair you know of course there's some regrets you know i mean so without sharing what the regret was how do you how do you reconcile the regret? I fixed it. Okay. I fixed it and I went forward. And obviously, you work to not repeat those. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Thank God it was many. Not one. No, it was not many. Yeah. You know. Very very few. You know. I mean, in general, I kept myself clean. Yeah. So one last question here. Obviously, Miami means a lot to you. You're building here. You believe it to be the hub, the bridge between Latin America and North America. And you're, a lot of your endeavors are in that direction. Right. Do you see Miami as a city outside of the work you're doing 
moving in that direction or do you feel you're fighting an uphill battle? It is an uphill battle uh, because number one, the city itself is one of the most difficult city to build anything or operate anything or the, the administration and the building department and the, it's, it's the toughest city. Really, like some ridiculous tough laws did not change from the 60s, from the 50s. And uh, I just came back from one of these meetings, you know, I mean, just, uh, I mean, uh, the way they, you know, the requirements and what and how, and they don't want to change. Um, you know, but of course it's an uphill battle, you know, you got to educate the U.S., our politicians today we got the Republican which became see I'm not Republican or Democrats I want just to understand for me a party is not a football team you know but when you're a party that peddling with conspiracy we cannot tolerate this kind of stuff okay so when they come with this America first idea and following the idiot and and this and the scam artist total scam artist you know I mean and there's no way other to, to describe him uh, you know, I mean, I tell the American, closing your door doesn't make your home safe. And showing your garbage through the window doesn't make them clean. Yeah. And this is what we need to do. So you see from the American, these two sides, that they don't want to recognize it, that they need, you know, to keep America safe, they really need to, instead of closing the borders, connecting to Latin America more, open mm -hmm. borders more, of course, not open immigration for now, but but being more open to connect these economies is one, you know. And I think uh, they're going in this direction, but they, they're not doing it as a whole vision. Today, Mexico became uh, our first uh, trade partner, okay? And this is a result of what happened with China and, uh, and so forth also. So uh, resources are getting shifted over there, but uh, the, the most obstacle is really getting to America. Listen. We went to Afghanistan, we put $2 trillion. Went to Iraq, we put $2 trillion. How about if you put part of it here to build middle class, that they don't come to our borders and build our infections over there so we can capitalize and everything. So this is an uphill battle, a battle really to educate the American who don't get the point that, that, that this is something that's going to pay off to do investment for tomorrow. Um, so we work on it and, and, and hopefully we can really do some impact in Washington at one point and bring it back to the fourth, for, for the fourth fund. Amazing. Moshe, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming. Moshe. Thank you for sharing your story, your incredible story. Thank you for telling me how you told John Gotti to, to come after you. <laughs> I mean, I... There's much more stories, believe me. I mean, I had knife chasing, I had guns to my head. Really? Oh, yeah. I mean, some stuff. <laughs> well, we're going to have to hear those stories one day. Thank you so much for, for sharing your time, uh, your knowledge, your wisdom. This was honestly an incredible conversation. I learned a ton from you. And I think there's going to be a lot of value that people can take from this conversation to really hear from someone who's built an empire essentially and is looking at bringing up communities together you know the social impact that you're having is you know i can't put words to it and uh i'm really hoping that we get to continue this conversation as you continue to build out you know miami becoming that hub that you dream it'll be and uh hopefully we can connect the next time in miami or if you're ever in toronto i think uh, it'd be great to connect again so thank you so much and to everyone who's listening and watching, thank you so much for tuning in uh, to this special episode from the Kimpton Epic Hotel here in Miami. Um, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe, follow, like, comment, share. All of that goes such a long way in getting these conversations out a lot further. Uh, and uh, appreciate every single one of you. So thank you very much for listening or watching, and uh, we'll be back soon. Thanks.